we last met here about three weeks ago. In those three weeks, the world has changed dramatically. And that change has come largely due to one incident, the Paris bombs of November 13th. And from it, the increasing realization that no society, however well it protects itself, is 100% safe today. The terror of Paris is not an isolated incident. It is the child of an event that took place almost exactly 15 years ago, 9-11. Terrorism has been around a long time, especially the politically motivated terrorism that concerns us. But 9-11 was a new landmark, a new stage, a new type of terrorism. It was a sophisticated modern activity using four airplanes, targeting great symbols of uh, civic life like World Trade Center, the Pentagon, involving an understanding of airline schedules, compute operations, and it was the definitive marriage of religion to terrorism producing jihadist terror. Okay. Since 9-11, terrorism has acquired many new instruments, modern explosives, there is now virtually a black market in illegal weapons from which they can purchase anything, cyber capacity, okay. uh, skill in using the social media, a network of very effective organizations, an ability to attract young people even from the Western world, okay. and many other accoutrements which are a mixture of old ideas and new technologies. And this is the paradox of current terrorism. It is the instrument of people with very anti-modern beliefs who are using modern methods to attain their ends. And that is what we have to face today. Right now, of course, there is a space of, a spate of terrorism, spasm. In the past month alone, there have been four major happenings and over a thousand people have been injured, uh, several hundred killed. On October 31st, the Russian tourist plane in Egypt was attacked. 230 people died. On November 12th, there was a major bombing in Beirut. 40 died, but hundreds were injured at rush hour. On Friday, November 13th, of course, was Paris. 130 dead, hundreds injured. More recently, on October 20th in Mali, uh, North Africa, a Radisson Hotel was attacked, probably targeting Westerners and some Chinese. Okay. Uh, in Israel, there has been uptick in the lone wolf terrorism of individuals. Okay. The boldness with which this is conducted, taking on Russia, taking on France, taking on America, and this is not the end. Okay. The impact on the Western world has been enormous. And in many ways, the Western reaction is just what the terrorists want. A small group of individuals using acts here and there as loudspeakers, terrifying large societies. Okay. Has induced a sense of panic in Europe and to a large degree here. Take this country, it's a country built on immigration and the general recognition that all religions are equal. Okay. The Paris incidents have brought out the worst in our political leaders. Uh, you've seen people manufacturing events. Somehow, some people saw hundreds of Muslims dancing on 9-11, okay? Uh, Donald Trump wants to expel all Syrians and close various religious houses of worship. Carson wants the surveillance of all Syrians in this country, okay? Ted Cruz, says that only Christians should be allowed in as uh, refugees. Jeb Bush supports that view, which tells you more about Jeb Bush's campaign and the state of it than what he was talking about. Uh, Governor Christie says that even five-year-old kids should be kept out as they are dangerous, okay? Uh, there is a move to enact all sorts of laws focusing on certain specific groups. This is something very serious because this country has had a history of such situations. The Chinese Exclusion Acts of the 1980s, the Japanese 
exclusion of 1908, and worse, the internment of Japanese-American citizens in the Second World War. And then some of us remember the McCarthy and the J. Edgar Hoover periods. Okay. I thought that we had passed that in recent times, and I hope that we will not see the return of such uh, focused uh, actions. Of course, we have to protect our society. We are, in many ways, easy victims. We are an open society with unusual freedoms of movement, access to public places, entry to mass transit. Try getting on a bus in Israel and you'll know uh, how free our society is. Okay? But if we cultivate a hysteria and pick on certain groups wholesale, we're damaging ourselves. And then comes the great question, what price civil liberties versus security? Okay. The Führer over refugees illustrates this. The government says that they would take in 10,000 refugees next year. They've already taken in about 1,000 Syrians. Okay. That's a very small amount. But the amount of noise would make you think that we are in the midst of an invasion by jihadist terrorists. Okay. And we are in election year. This becomes a political football. It's the worst time. Just imagine what the reaction will be if, heaven forbid, there is a serious attack on this country by terrorists. Okay. But our reaction is relatively small compared to what is happening in Europe. Okay. Uh, every country in Europe is in something like a panic. There are four major countries in Europe, France, Britain, Germany, and Italy. They account for 60% of the economy of Europe, 60% of the population, and they house about 65% of the Islamic uh, people of Europe, okay, the Muslims. Okay. In France, there's a state of emergency, which will go for three months at least. Uh, law restrictions on law enforcement have been lifted. It's possible to arrest anyone for any reason, confine them. Okay. In Britain, all sorts of restrictions have been introduced. Uh, in Germany, very open until recently, they are considering closing the borders. Okay. Mrs. Merkel has taken a very courageous stand in saying we should allow refugees into Germany, partly, I think, uh, to correct German abusers of history, but she's paying a huge political price for this. Okay. In Italy, there's a tremendous fear of refugees crossing the Mediterranean, only 300 miles away from North Africa. These are the four major countries of Europe. They've all accepted and welcomed Islamic uh, uh, people. Uh, France has five million, six million Islamic people, mainly from former French colonies. That's about seven and a half percent of France's population. Germany has about six percent, about five million uh, Islamic people, whom they, most of whom they invited in after the Second World War because they were short of labor, many from Turkey and Kurds. Britain has about 5% of its population, about 3, 4 million Islamic people. There are altogether in Europe about 25, 30 million Islamic people. They are living in great fear today. Okay. A small country like Belgium has almost collapsed in panic. The whole country has been shut down for several days. Schools closed, universities closed, public transport closed, borders closed, public places curfewed all because they suspect there may be an attack and some Paris terrorist once lived in Brussels. Okay. Europe is going through a very difficult time right now. Until the middle of the past decade, say 2000, 2005 or so, modern Europe was a great success. It had recovered from the Second World War. It had introduced enormous social benefits for its people, very expensive, of course. Okay. It was an orderly democratic society. Okay. War had virtually ceased in Western Europe. Okay. Uh, and in the past few years, they've received a triple whammy. First, the financial crisis of 2008 hit them very badly. Now, some of the Northern European countries have recovered. Britain has recovered somewhat. Germany has, wasn't hit very badly. But in the south of Europe, the effect is still there. Unemployment in Greece is 25%. Unemployment in Spain is 22%. Unemployment in Italy is 12%. Unemployment in Portugal is close to 20%. Okay. Uh, when 
the countries of Northern Europe, try to help the countries of Southern Europe, the people of Northern Europe resent this, saying that you're trying to use our money to help these southern deadbeats. Okay. In the past, we would have helped Europe, but we are not in a position to help them anymore. So they have to manage on their own, and the financial crisis continues. Okay. That's the first whammy. The second is the refugee crisis of the past couple of years. The refugee crisis in its larger context is this. There are two parts of the world a stable part of the world in which we live, the countries where people carry out their daily activities, kids go to school, go to work, okay? Uh, we have an orderly society. Another part of the world is an unstable part of the world. Borders are not clear. All sorts of disrupt social disruptions take place. Now, because of the ease of communication, other facilities, the unstable world is pouring out a cascade of people into the stable world, and that is the cause of the refugee situation. Instability is provoking an unprecedented flow of people from unstable to stable areas, okay? And that is what Europe principally has to cope with because Europe is the frontier. After the First World War, there were one million displaced people. It was considered a huge number of people. After the Second World War, it was 40 million. It was considered to be enormous. Today, there are 60 million displaced people around the world. Okay. Europe, the frontier, is attracting these people. In the past year or so, one and a half million people are either inside Europe or just about to try and get into Europe. Okay. And they're all coming from one particular part of the world, North Africa and the Middle East. This creates another big moral question. Western countries have recently been going to non-Western countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya. All sorts of problems have been created due to this. And then Western countries say, well, okay, now we are going away. We leave behind chaos. Have we any responsibility to the people who are in a state of chaos because of Western intervention? Well, Europe has to face the brunt of it, okay? Uh, they're coming from as far away as Afghanistan. Syria is a country with a population of 21, 22 million people. 12 million people are refugees, 60% in that country. Over 4 million have left the country. They have gone to Turkey, 2.5 million, Jordan, 600,000 others are heading for Europe on foot, by vehicle, by train, by boat being smuggled in any way possible, okay. and winter is coming. Okay. In North Africa, we intervened, we got rid of Gaddafi in Libya, and the country has fallen apart. All sorts of chaos is taking place in Libya, and now refugees from Libya are crossing the Mediterranean three, four hundred miles away to southern Europe. Okay. Europe doesn't know what to do. Europe has been used to sending people to the rest of the world. In the 1800s, 70 million Europeans left Europe and went to America, to Canada, Australia, and other places, okay? Now it has to receive people, and this is a wholly new experience on this scale. So what do they do? Are they to accept these people? Well, Germany has said that it'll accept as many as they can take, and they were talking about taking up to one million people. Mrs. Merkel is very strong on this. Now there's a huge political revolt, and it's not certain whether she will be able to accomplish what she wanted to do. Okay. Uh, are they to drive these people away? Okay. Well, some countries have started building huge fences. Hungary has built 350 miles of fences between Hungary and the Serbian border and the Slovakian border and so on. 13 feet high steel frames, chain link fences with coils of razor wire with armed guards protecting this, okay? Ready to drive away people or shoot them if necessary. Some countries have taken islands like Greece and Italy and lodged these refugees on islands. How long can you keep them there? Will they be like concentration camps? What will they become, okay? Some are returning them, knowing very well that when you send them, push them back, 
some will die on the way. Europe just doesn't know how to deal with this. And with the coming of winter, this is going to get much worse. So that is the second whammy, fin finance and then refugees. And now, of course, the third whammy, uh, the, the uh, Paris terror. See? All this endangers the European Union. The European Union has three or four remarkable achievements, almost unique in modern history. The first is this, the political achievement of bringing together 28 countries and mold them into a peaceful area. These 28 countries in Europe have spent most of the past thousand years fighting each other. They are of different religions, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, others, okay. They have, some have a democratic tradition, some have a monarchical tradition, some have a dictatorial tradition. They've all been uh, put into a democratic frame, human rights, rule of law, okay. They come from different cultures, from the north, from the south, okay. This area has been devastated by war for centuries, and yet since the European Union, past 70 years or so, there's been no significant war in Western Europe. Okay. Now, anti-European forces, Union forces are rising. Some countries want to get out of it. Britain is having a referendum within a year on whether to leave the Union. If Britain leaves the Union, it will be a great blow uh, to the whole concept of European uh, unity. Okay. Greece and Italy are thinking of leaving, thinking it'll help their enfeebled economies. So the politi great political achievement of building something unique in the world is now shaken. Second great achievement was the introduction of the euro currency. The euro currency is also almost unique. It is a currency that comes from nowhere. It doesn't come from a country. Most all currencies come from a historical experience of a country. It was created about uh, 15 years ago. Coins, notes, replaced all the old currencies, the francs, the marks, the uh, lira. Okay. It is managed by a European Central Bank, European Federal Reserve in Frankfurt. Okay. And it was a remarkably strong currency for most of its history. Okay. It was introduced at the rate of one for one for the dollar. It uh, went up to 160 uh, for a dollar. Now it's back to about 105. If it continues to decline, Europe will be in even worse trouble than it is. It is the centerpiece of the European financial system. Now Britain stayed out of the euro currency, but there was always the hope that Britain would join and strengthen it even further. But now that chance is very remote. So the euro currency, this great achievement, uh, is in danger. Why is it a great achievement? We live in a world of about 200 countries okay, who use about 160 different currencies. Okay. Some of them not worth the paper they are printed on. Okay. Uh, increasingly, in a globalized world, it's becoming difficult to manage a world economy with all these currencies. And the euro is suggesting a way in which to do this that we will have currency groups that will subsume various economies, make it easy to manage the globalized world economy. So that far-seeking economic thinkers were thinking that there would be an euro eurozone, there would be a dollar zone for North and South America, there would be a yen or Japanese, uh, Chinese renminbi for the Far East, and in between other countries will join these, and there would be some currency stability. That model is now in pieces, and the euro currency itself is endangered. The third great achievement of the European Union may well be its biggest achievement. It was called the Shenzhen Agreement after a small town in Luxembourg where it was signed in 1995. 22 of the 28 states abolished all visas, passport controls, ID checks, free movement of goods and people in that area. This is the beginning of a federation, okay? Uh, border controls were removed. 
You just enter the European Union, you can go all over the place. Okay? Britain stayed out, of course, Ireland stayed out. But uh, this was something remarkable. You cannot have a union with various barriers. Imagine if we had barriers, 50 barriers in this country for our states. Okay? This is the beginning of something much greater, this gateway to political union. Now, uh, there is a big movement to restore uh, boundary controls, okay, to bring back all sorts of uh, border restrictions, and that will inevitably affect the Union uh, if it continues. The results of all of this are, of course, the rise of right-wing political parties in Europe. These right-wing parties, drawing anything from 5 to 10 percent of the vote, now polls show that they're 30, 35 percent in many countries. Okay. Never forget that when extreme right-wing parties become powerful in Europe, anti-Semitism follows soon. Okay. Uh, the openness of countries is being questioned. Okay. Uh, there is a possibility that people like Le Pen's daughter in France could be a, a leader of France in the future, which is drawing a lot of uh, public support. Eastern Europe has become a fertile field for right-wing political parties. Southern Europe, okay, and that is one thing. The second is, of course, that the European Union had tried to develop some kind of a plan for these refugees, okay, allocating various countries, trying to find some way in absorbing some of them. That is in shatters. No, it is shattered. Countries are refusing to follow the European plan. So what are you going to do with all these refugees? Are they going to pile up on the border? Some have got in. Is it going to be a source of great disturbance? Is it going to be a huge financial burden? Okay. Uh, what about the humanitarian question? And then, of course, the other question is the question I mentioned earlier, civil liberties. All these move countries towards something like police states in the name of security, and public accepts this. Okay? So the European Union is in crisis. It's basic values, the great achievements are being questioned. And we don't know whether this will be a little blip or whether it will be a trend that continues. Okay. Europe, after all, is a major part of Western society. And if Western society is set back by uh, the retreat of open societies in Europe, we will all pay a price for it. Okay. So the European situation has implications far beyond Europe itself. Now, who, why is it, what is the cause of this? One of the principal sources is, of course, ISIS, okay? this organization. Okay? We have to remember two things about ISIS. It is not the only terrorist organization, although it has emerged as a leading one right now. And second, not every Islamic believer or Muslim is a terrorist. Now, what is ISIS and what is it, how, it has, how has it provoked this situation? ISIS is a relatively new organization. It was a branch that broke away from Al-Qaeda about 10 years ago because they thought that Al-Qaeda was too kind. Okay? And a small group broke away. They functioned on their own for a while in Iraq. In uh, five years ago, in 2010, it was taken over by a... Uh, their present leader, a man called al-Baghdadi. He's about 40 years old. He's a scholar. He must have some great organizational talent because he has created this organization into what it is today. Okay. ISIS is, has two parts to it. One part is extremely unusual. It is the first terrorist organization to create a state and a country of its own. A part of Iraq joined to a part of Syria across the border. Eight million people live under its government. The territory is about a little smaller than the size of New York State. It has a capital, a city in uh, Syria called Raqqa. Another, the second largest city in Iraq, Mosul, is occupied by ISIS. They have a for government, they have departments. They carry on uh, a regular type of government with terrifying penalties. It has an army of its own, variously estimated 
at between 50 to 100,000 uh, fighters, many of whom have come from the West or from outside. Of the uh, fighters, about 20% are from outside that area. That's about something like 20,000. And about 10,000 have come from the Western world. Some of them are Islamics in the Western world. Some are people like you and I, who have never shown any signs of uh, interest in Islam before. From this country, about 300 have gone, American, men and some women. Okay. From Europe, about 3,000. Okay. From Russia, something like 4,000, which is not surprising because many of them come from Islamic Russia, Chechnya and other places, which is in revolt against uh, uh, Russia itself. So somewhere close to about 10,000 have come from the Western world. What motivates them? Why do they participate in a system so barbaric? It's difficult to understand this. Okay. Uh, they have finances. Uh, they had captured some oil wells in eastern uh, Syria and northern Iraq. And uh, they get about $50 million a month by selling oil at a big discount. Uh, there are rogue traders all over the world who will buy oil at a very big discount and trade it on the world market and sneak it out from those areas. Now, those areas are being bombed right now, uh, but they've been getting some money from that. They get money from taxes, the people they govern, from kidnapping of rich people in the Middle East who pay ransom but don't talk about it, okay, uh, of some contributions from various people in Middle Eastern countries, and they don't seem to be short of uh, money. They've also established now a beachhead in Libya. We removed Qaddafi from Libya, and the country has fallen into a civil war equally vicious to that in Syria. Okay. Different groups are fighting, and in ISIS has taken opportunity to establish a beachhead there. Okay. It may be a fallback if they are driven out of Iraq and Syria. Okay. Uh, they have built up the personality cult of the leader. They call him the Caliph al-Baghdadi. Okay. They have been attacked regularly. Uh, 20,000 of their fighters have been killed in the past year. They have lost some territory, but they survive. Okay. They are trying now to capture some of the oil fields of Libya. Not yet, but they are trying to do that. So, one part of ISIS is the first terrorist state that has been created. Okay. But there is another part of ISIS, which is its shadowy part. That is, groups of terrorists here and there. There are, as far as we know, something like 30 affiliates of ISIS in North Africa and the Middle East, some who carry out things like the Paris engagement. They are clever terrorists. Uh, some of them are lone wolf type terrorists. They are financed by ISIS. They are helped by ISIS. Okay. It's difficult to track them down. Now, this is the ISIS structure. Okay. Not a single government in the Middle East or anywhere in the world supports them, but they seem to have ample sources of revenue. They are being attacked by two coalitions. One coalition is that which we belong, okay? United States and France, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, okay? uh, many Syrian groups, and the Kurds of Syria. This group uh, doesn't have many foot soldiers. We depend on groups that are against Assad in Syria to also fight ISIS, and the Kurds. Okay. We are bombing from there. Okay. The Saudis give some assistance, the Turks give some assistance, but the main source of uh, attack comes from these uh, Syrian groups, the Kurds, and some Iraqis. Okay. Uh, we pay a lot of money for this. There is another coalition that is also attacking them, that is the Russian uh, group, Iran, Russia, Iraq, Assad, 
Hezbollah. They've got troops on the ground. Okay. Uh, Iran has sent troops. Hezbollah has sent thousands of troops to fight ISIS. Okay. Assad's troops are fighting ISIS. Okay. Iraq has some troops fighting ISIS. Okay. Uh, and Russia, since September 30th, has not only bombed, but also begun to introduce some troops. It's a very big risk that Putin is taking, but he has done it. Okay. At the moment, there are about four or 5,000 Russian troops involved in this. These are the two coalitions that are both attacking ISIS. Now, Al-Qaeda is a separate organization that is also attacking ISIS, but not affiliated with any of the coalitions, right? Now, the problem is that these two coalitions don't get on with each other. Okay? That our coalition and the Russian coalition are not coordinating, they're not happy with each other. There are major differences, okay? And one of the big differences is Assad. We say Assad must go. It's almost a mantra of our government, Assad must go, Assad must go. Uh, Russia says, no, Assad must stay. Uh, Iran says, Assad must stay. Okay. Uh, Hezbollah says, Assad must stay. So over that, we have all sorts of differences. Uh, we accuse Russia of bombing some of the people whom we support in Syria because they are against Assad. They say they are bombing ISIS as well as others. It's a very confused state. So there is recognizing that Syria is the main source of this problem. Uh, Secretary of Kerry organized a conference on Syria in Vienna on November 13th. All the parties were called with great difficulty. First, we objected to Iran being called, but Iran came. Russia came. Okay. Saudis came. Others came. But Assad wasn't there. We didn't advise Assad. So there was a lot of discussion how to straighten this out, how to cooperate better, but nothing very much came out of it. Okay. In the meanwhile, Putin has taken a very active role in this. And he says that this is not the time for us to have differences. And he made two major speeches about this. One at the United Nations at the end of September, and the other about 10 days ago at the International Conference of the Leading Countries Group of 20 in Istanbul. He said, this is not the right time to uh, figure out which country is doing better and which country is doing worse. We have to be united in international effort it's needed against the terrorist group. He said we need support from Russia, from America, from Europe, from Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iran, and so on. And he says uh, we are prepared to cooperate with America, with other countries, uh, but unfortunately other countries are not cooperating with us. It's a nice offer, but there's a subtext to it, which is this. What he is saying is, let us get together. And in fact, he used an interesting analogy. He said in the Second World War, Russia and America had great differences, but we got together to defeat the greatest problem in the world, which was Hitler. Now the greatest problem, says Putin, is jihadism. We must get together to do it. Uh, but there's a subtext to it. Remove the sanctions on Russia uh, over the Crimea. Stop criticizing Russia for human rights. Okay. Uh, we can get together then. Okay. We have not accepted that. We may have to revise that uh, position sometime. Okay. So this is the present situation. It is not, not, it is quite likely in this situation when everybody is bombing everybody else that incidents take place. And a Russian plane was shot by the Turks. Okay which then makes the differences between these groups even larger. NATO, uh, Turkey says we are members of NATO. This is a Russian attack on NATO. Russia says it wasn't over Turkish territory. Okay. And uh, this has led to some further estrangement. France is trying to patch this up. The French president was in Moscow. He was in uh, Washington. He's trying to uh, see whether they can bring these groups together. But Russia and Turkey have great similarities, although they are uh, opposed to each other right now. They are both great old empires, the Tsarist Empire and the Ottoman Empire, that lost a great deal. They are countries which got into a terrible mess in recent times. 
about 15 years ago, two leaders arose in each of them, Putin in uh, Russia and Erdogan in uh, Turkey. Uh, they have restored order and stability in those countries, but increasingly become more and more authoritarian. Both countries are kind of one-man show. And now they're on either side of the uh, conflict in Syria, but both against uh, uh, ISIS, which they fear will take over Syria. So we are in trying to balance this. We are trying to work this out. And hopefully some kind of agreement will be forged, because otherwise uh, we will not get the job done. Okay. Now, as a result of this huge, huge publicity given to this incident in Paris, something else has happened. As you know, these events, one assassination takes place, it leads to imitation assassinations around the world. Same thing with this. Competitive terrorism is now taking place. Okay. Al-Qaeda, somewhat downgraded recently. Its leaders have been, uh, most of their leaders have been killed. It's taken a backseat to ISIS. It's trying to show that it can compete with ISIS. Okay. It has begun terrorist activities in North Africa, in Mali, in other areas. Okay. Uh, you see a pickup in the lone wolf terrorism in Israel. Okay. Uh, in places like Nigeria, you see an acceleration of terrorism because one terrorist incident has an amplifier effect. Okay. Now, as we look to the future, it is possible that the combined attacks of both coalitions will have some uh, impact on ISIS, weaken ISIS in Syria and uh, in Iraq. It may be that ISIS is planning already to shift to Libya, okay. uh, but we will need more boots on the ground. There is a move by some people in this country and many in other parts of the world to get our boots on their ground. Okay. I think it will be very dangerous if Western boots are put in the Middle East. We got to put more and more pressure on the Arab countries to have their troops if they want this problem solved. Okay. Uh, and we have to make certain very clear choices. Right now, the United States faces three challenges. Competition with China, confrontation with uh, Russia, and war on terrorism. It is my contention that we can't do all three at the same time. We have to pick our priorities. Okay? Uh, and I would like to see our trying to make some arrangement with Putin uh, in order to combat terrorism. Putin has taken a very big risk. He's aware of what Russian intrusion into Afghanistan cost that country in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, but uh, he's committed to this. He's not the nicest of men. I don't recommend him as your boyfriend or your son-in-law. But you know, you sometimes have to uh, make deals as we did with Stalin. Okay? Uh, and given his determination, perhaps we should reconsider our approach to Russia. Uh, this is a very complex thing. What he did in the Ukraine was wrong. Do we have to swallow that? I don't know, but something we have to consider. Okay. Uh, Putin himself feels deeply threatened. 20% of the Russian population are Islamic in the south. They're in revolt, mainly in and around Chechnya. Acts of jihadist terrorism have been spreading in Russia. Okay. And he's very afraid that the ISIS elements of the Middle East will connect with the uh, Russian Islamic south of that country. Okay. There are already some connections. People are going from one side to the other. Okay. So it is in his interest also to uh, take the action he's taking. We will have to make some decision in the next few months about this. Okay. In the long run, 
it seems to me that terrorism will be defeated. There are too many pressures against it. It's too disturbing for the people they govern, the way they kill people, their own people, okay? And it is somewhat analogous to what happened in Europe a uh, 125 years ago. At the turn of the 20th century, about 1890, 1900, there were a group of terrorists called anarchists. They were bomb throwers, they were individuals who shot leaders. They were those who wanted to upset the governments of countries. There were a couple of outreachers uh, here in this country too. They, one of them assassinated President McKinley, uh, killed the King of Italy, assassinated the Tsar of Russia, bombed the Paris Stock Exchange, assaulted banks. Okay. Uh, people were very afraid of them. One of them uh, killed the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, and that began the First World War. Uh, governments cooperated. They got rid of them. The war came. Anarchists faded away. I think that uh, today's ISIS is probably somewhat like that. In time, it will fade away. But it will take a lot of effort, a lot of cooperation, joining with people we are not comfortable with in order to do this. For example, uh, we will have to probably tolerate Assad. The Putin view is this that Assad is like the stopper of a club soda bottle. You remove him, the whole thing will explode. Something like what happened when we removed Saddam Hussein or removed uh, Gaddafi in Libya. And so for the time being, keep him there. Our view is that we must uh, get rid of Assad. The Putin view is that all jihadists are bad guys. Our view is that there are some good jihadists and bad jihadists. By good, I mean potentially good. If we help them, they will defeat Assad. Okay. They will defeat ISIS and maybe establish a Jeffersonian democracy in Syria. Okay. <laughs> that has been the expectation of American presidents for a long time. George W. Bush, okay. uh, Barack Obama. Okay. Uh, Bill Clinton, okay. that there are some people whom you can nurture and win over. Okay. Putin's view is you cannot do that. Okay. I might point out to you that the first President Bush was much wiser than his son. Not difficult, but anyway. Okay. Yeah. He said, we're not removing Saddam Hussein. Okay. Uh, we'll defeat him, we'll keep him in his cage, because we don't know what will happen when we remove Saddam Hussein. Some people in the army said, we march to Baghdad, take him out. He said, no, keep him there. And his son did just the opposite, and all hell has broken loose. So uh, we have to consider the various options. I think that in time, if we learn some of these lessons, we will be able to uh, cope with this. But the cost is going to be very high, and the cost is ultimately how many freedoms do we sacrifice in our country for security. Okay. Israel is an interesting example where they have an ongoing constant struggle with things like this okay. and they've learned how to cope with it. Okay. Uh, right now it's going through a difficult period because of this lone wolf terrorism. They don't know whether it's going to morph into some new big intifada or whether it'll fade away but they've taken all the security precautions that they can take and uh, survive. Sometimes they restrict information that goes into the press. Okay. Sometimes they do unorthodox things and they pay a price for it. But society has survived. Will we have to do the same thing or not? These are the big questions that are posed to us by what is happening right now. And the terror of Paris brings this into sharp focus uh, as an issue which affects all Western societies right now. I cannot give you answers. I'm trying to define the questions so that we will be able to respond in some meaningful way. Okay. This is a contemporary question.
question, something that's happening right now. I now want to take 10 minutes of your time to talk about a longer term question. Okay. A little different from my agenda, but it is this. Tomorrow in Paris, 200 nations meet for an environmental uh, conference. Okay. The essence of the environmental problem is this. It's explained in many ways, but this is one way of looking at it. About 400 million years ago, some, something happened which created an atmosphere around the planet Earth. Okay. That atmosphere consists of oxygen, nitrogen, argon, carbon dioxide, and a few trace elements, water vapor among them. That atmosphere, which surrounds the planet Earth, a small envelope, okay, doesn't go very far. After about seven miles, eight miles, it's very difficult to sustain life. The atmosphere gets thinner, and about 60 miles or so, it's outer space, there's a vacuum. So the highest point on Earth, Mount Everest, is about six miles high. Okay. That atmosphere okay, is where all life has existed. That is where human beings, plant life, animal life, developed. Okay. Now, human life developed in a very tentative way. Nowhere else in the universe, as far as we know, does anything like this exist. Okay. And it exists just around in the atmosphere of the planet Earth. But it wasn't very stable for a long time. About 12,000 years ago, there were, scientists tell us, about 5 million people on Earth. And there was a real possibility that life, human life would become extinct because they didn't know how to shelter from the elements. The big animals whom they were hunting to get their food were dying out. Dinosaurs, other things were dying out. Uh, it's quite possible that life would have become extinct and nowhere else in the universe is there life. Then something happened about 12,000 years ago. Uh, that's somewhere around 10,000 BC. Somebody discovered agriculture. And from that time, numbers have increased. Agriculture gave people a steady source of food. From that, they began to learn how to shelter from the elements, get some clothing, use fire, various things like that. And suddenly, human numbers began to increase a great deal. The atmosphere has remained constant for 400 million years. And these human beings have lived in this atmosphere. Okay. Uh, about 200 years ago, these human beings reached a new stage in civilization, the Industrial Revolution. And in the past 200 years, the Industrial Revolution has changed the way people live around the world. It has changed the world based on wood and wind and animals to a world of coal and steel and oil and natural gas. And for the past 200 years, we have been putting, with these new sources of energy, various things into the environment, notably carbon dioxide. Okay. Fossil fuels on which the Industrial Revolution was based, coal, natural gas, okay, oil, emit carbon. When you drive a car, you emit carbon. Okay. Now, if you change the composition of the atmosphere, we don't know whether human life can continue. Okay. Probably not, okay. unless we all wear space suits or something like that. Okay. So for 200 years, we've been changing the composition. In the past 50 years or so, we've been adding more and more emissions and now there's evidence that the atmosphere showing the results of this. The melting of the ice caps, North Pole, South Pole, huge sheets of ice which locked water for centuries, like Greenland, slowly beginning to melt. Changes in weather, what we call global warming. Okay. Agricultural output, unreliability of the rains. Okay. 
change in fertility, okay, uh, increase in forest fires, are suggesting that something is happening in the atmosphere. Scientists tell us that if we continue like this, a few more small changes, we will change the atmosphere very substantially. Uh, the oceans will rise. Whether it can sustain human life, we don't know. We have maybe half a century or so to do something. And it's doable. Renewable energy, which does not emit these uh, fossil fuel gases, what are called greenhouse gases, uh, wind, solar, even nuclear, although that has other problems, okay, uh, don't create this problem. Okay. And sometimes it's resolvable. Look at uh, something that you all know very well. When communications was introduced, telephone, telegraph, it was with copper wire. Copper wire was very damaging to the environment, carbon emissions in mining, in smelting, getting it ready. Then about 30 years ago, copper wire was replaced with the kind of plastic wire, okay, uh, photo-optical wires, a little improvement in the emissions. Now it's wireless, no emissions. Okay. So there are things that are doable. The question is, will we do it? And that is what this conference is all about. Okay. Who produces the carbon emissions? Industrial countries, other countries. Who will pay for renewable energy? How will this be measured? Okay. Uh, will the change in the temperature, small change over a period of time, is it controllable? Or will it uh, go on like this? What will be the impact on human life and ultimately on whether human beings will inhabit this planet or not. Okay. These nations are meeting and hopefully they will come to some agreement which will work out some kind of a plan. The big question is this. Can countries which are so opposed to each other and all other things cooperate on the environment? Okay. That's one thing. The second is if they do, will they be able to make the concerted effort and is there enough time? Scientists say there is if we make a concerted effort. Okay. So that is what this is all about. Uh, you all know the simple truth. You have a bowl of water, a bathtub of water. You use it. You put a little bit of dirt into it, you can use it. A little more dirt, you use it. At some point, you put a little more dirt, it can't be used. That is our atmosphere. So, this is the first step. We have not spoken about water pollution or soil pollution or noise pollution, but this is the most immediate need. And you can't resolve it unless there's cooperation among nations because if you pollute here, there's no point in Canada being clean. The winds will take this. So, this is a big challenge. Ultimately, it is the greatest challenge in the long term for the human species. Because, as I began by saying, human life is not the norm of the universe. We are, in many ways, a little freak, an experiment. Nowhere else in the cosmos, as far as we know, there are all sorts of talk about little green men running around and flying saucers, but nothing. There's no one else. There's nowhere else. Uh, if we do things that eventually lead to our extinct extinction, there'll be nobody to mean, to, to mourn us. We go back to the normal state of the universe, which is uh, no human life. Okay. So therefore, does it matter? Okay. If human beings want to destroy themselves, what does it matter? Okay. It's not very important in the universe. But there's another way of looking at it, which is that because it is so rare and so unusual, human life is a great treasure that should be nurtured and preserved something unique in the cosmos. And who will preserve it? We ourselves. That is the great challenge of uh, the conference that is meeting tomorrow. Whether human beings will meet that challenge or not is something that we will know pretty soon. And in the long term, that is probably the greatest question that human beings feel right now. Thank you. Thank you. I, I went a 
I went a little bit off target because you will hear a great deal about the environmental conference in the next few years, but there are different ways of looking at it. So we have two big issues. One is the great immediate concern of security, of terrorism and safety, and then the long-term issue that I want to focus on. We have some time for questions. Do I hear? Do I see? Yeah. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah. I'll repeat it. Okay. Okay. The distinction between immigrants and refugees. Okay. We admit to this country every year about one million immigrants on the basis of skills, on the basis of relatives, and so on. Okay. The question is, what do you do with the refugees over and above that? That we will continue to, uh, hopefully, to admit people, although that is also now being uh, questioned. Uh, what do you do with this huge influx of people, which are humanitarian issues, which are uh, issues of uh, politics, uh, and that is separate? So every immigrant is not a refugee. Every refugee could be an immigrant. We have been issuing all sorts of visas. We issue uh, uh, business visas. We issue uh, visas for skill. We issue uh, compassionate visas. And the refugee will come under compassion. We have issued compassionate visas in the past to many people, Cubans, to Hungarian refugees, to uh, boat people from Vietnam. We issued 300,000 uh, uh, visas uh, 30 years ago. So will this come in that category? Immigrants. The regular immigrant uh, is different from this. That is a person who is employable, has relatives here, something like that. So that is the distinction. Okay? I might just draw your attention to one thing. This country has been built on immigration. I don't know how many of you, myself included, will be here if we apply today's immigration laws to our ancestors. Okay? Now, however, until fairly recently, the bulk of immigration has been people of white European stock. Now we are seeing something new, a different culture, different religion. Can we incorporate them as we did the others in the past? Okay. That's the big question. Okay. That is the question Europe faces, okay. and we do too. We have a much better record than Europe, of course, in this. Somebody else had their hand up. Yes, yes, yes. yes sir. Um, there is a coda to your conclusion that not every Muslim is a terrorist. Could you comment on the other side of that conclusion that every terrorist is a Muslim? <laughs> I said every Muslim is not a terrorist, but is every terrorist a Muslim? No. We have had a fair number of our own terrorists. Timothy McVeigh, remember him? Una Bomber, remember him? Okay. Right now, it looks as if a, bulk, a lot of them come from jihadist sources. And that was what I said, 9-11. But I think it's wrong to say every one uh, of them is a Muslim. There are a lot of them who come from the Middle East. But uh, there are, you don't have to look at Muslims to find terrorists everywhere in the world today. Yes. I don't understand the comparison between the anarchists and ISIS. The anarchists, yeah. as I understand it, were very few in number. They were kind of the armed wing of the Dada movement in art. We know how that wound up. Uh, there was no religious underpinning for the anarchists, and they vanished in a yeah. short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, the jihadists, good or bad, yeah. have been around for quite a while, okay. not just until since yeah, yeah, yeah. So it seems to me that that's an inapt comparison. Okay. Uh, why do I compare them with the anarchists? Is it a valid comparison or not? I compare it like this. From about 1880 to about 1914, anarchists in induced fear in the Western world. Okay? Now, there are different sources. They had a 
a theory of this is a man called Kropotkin, another man called Bakunin who do this. Some of them were sourced in the art movement, some of them in the political movement, okay. Some of them were religious fanatics, some were secular, okay. They all had the idea of destroying and creating panic in the Western world. The techniques were the same. Uh, and they did frighten people tremendously. So to that extent, they were similar. Okay. In the end, countries got together, they were wiped out, they disappeared, the war came. Uh, my comparison was, is that you get from time to time groups like this uh, who will do anything to further their ends, okay, and they don't succeed all the time. That's, that was my comparison. Okay? Because society in a hundred years or so ago was terrified of these anarchists. Okay? In Europe, they had all sorts of restrictions. They were not, they were small fringe groups, so are these terrorists today. But they created havoc. Okay? They didn't, uh, uh, fortunately, they didn't last so long. They were not rooted, many of them were not rooted in religion. Some were fanatics, but some were not. Some were political lunatics, okay? Kropotkin, Bakunin, all these people, okay? There was a woman here whose name you're familiar to called Emma Goldman, okay? Who then was an anarchist, then later became a communist socialist and all that, okay? Johannes Most, okay? Many of them were European uh, migrants to this country. So that's the loose comparison I made, okay? Yeah. Yes? It's very difficult to answer that question. What does the Wahhabist educational system in Saudi Arabia have in its applicability to ISIS? Okay? There are many similar features to this, but the Saudis themselves seem to be very much against uh, ISIS. Okay? Uh, I think that the similarities are there, but the Saudi state is very much against ISIS today. The Saudi religious leaders have come out against uh, ISIS right now. Okay? The chief mullah of Saudi Arabia has made strong statements about this. So I think there are similarities, but I think the organizations have, in different ways, they've moved in different structures. There is some suspicion that certain individuals from the Gulf have given money to uh, ISIS. Okay? Uh, in fact, Putin at his last speech said there are lists that he has given of people who he had, Russia has tracked with this, okay? Uh, whether they are giving it as protection, you know, here's some money, you do it to other people, don't do it to us. Or, which was the case in many cases with Al-Qaeda, okay? Gave money and don't do it to us, do it to us. Uh, or whether it's out of conviction, it's difficult to say, but that is now being tracked. Uh, our, our tracking system is improving on that. Uh, the Saudis themselves, the Saudi government now, is sufficiently alarmed to take this seriously. The question is, how many boots will they put on the ground in this? They are already uh, fighting in Yemen okay, uh, against uh, extremist rebels. Um, will they, there are some assistance in uh, Syria, but they have to go more. Okay? That's, that's a big question. And we have to push for that. Okay. Yeah. I am sometimes more scared when I'm told Saudis are our friends than when, <laughs> but that's another whole issue <laughs> and a controversial one. Uh, yes. Yes, ma'am. I read recently that the Saudis and the Emirates are hiring Christian South American mercenaries. Yeah. Are yeah. They doing this because they don't want Muslims killing Muslims? No, because they don't have enough fighters. Yeah. They're hiring mercenaries. Okay. Now, you know, the question is, uh, the Gulf people are hiring some mercenaries, some from Croatia, some from South America, to do their fighting for them. Okay. Uh, is it because they don't want Islamic people to kill Islamic people? No. They are paying others to kill Islamic people. It's more or less the same but they are short of people and they don't have, these are trained fighters, okay? So, uh, will mercenaries do your killing for you as effectively as if you do it yourself? Big question, okay? Uh, 
so, uh, so f there are various reports that maybe four, five thousand, six thousand mercenaries are being trained. Okay, uh, we don't know. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yes. ISIS is selling fifty million dollars a month worth of oil. Yeah. Could we tell whoever is buying it not to, or are there humanitarian? <laughs> no. That was a figure come based on their smuggling of oil, okay? Now it is less. There are rogue traders in the world who will buy anything cheap and intermingle it with oil on the world market and sell it. Okay. You remember when there was an oil boycott of this country, 1979-80, that there were some companies which enforced it and later they were prosecuted. There were some traders, I think it's a man in Texas who's in prison now, who was breaking this, doing various things. There are always people who will uh, do this, okay? And they're smuggling it out of ISIS areas. Uh, if you can, if the price of oil is $50 a barrel, and you can buy it from ISIS at $25 a barrel, and then mix it with other oil and sell it at $30, $40, there are people who will do it. There are traders in the Western world who will do it. Now that is being tracked much better than it used to be, okay? And getting oil out of the ISIS areas is more difficult than it was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons is that Russia is also bombing those uh, areas. Yes. Yeah. A little louder, please. There are some countries outside the Middle East which are very disturbed Islamic countries that Islam is getting a jihadist, uh, being tarred with a jihadist brush. Indonesia is one of them. They have uh, a more moderate form of Islam, they say, and they're trying to set up an international organization to compete with it. Malaysia is another, okay. Bangladesh is a third. Uh, these are non-Middle Eastern uh, countries mainly, okay. Mm, so that is their, they say, we are being, all being called terrorists. We must prove that it's not. We must convince Islamic, we must convince the Western world that we are not, and they are doing various things. But they have a big problem on their own hands. In Indonesia, you remember, there have been terror, Islamic terrorist activities in Bali, in uh, Jakarta, okay? So they have to combat that. There are many who are doing this, yes. What effect they will have, I don't know, okay? There's another thing that we have to think about. There are, there, this should not turn into a Western crusade against Islam. But some elements of that are appearing. The chief uh, patriarch of Russia, okay, it's a man called Kirill. Okay. He's uh, like the Pope of the Orthodox Church. He's very much in Putin's pocket. He has issued a statement saying that is a righteous Christian thing to do that Putin is doing. Okay. That has been uh, responded to by some Islamic clerics in the Western world saying, ah, this is the Crusades once again. Christian nations are now trying to attack uh, Muslim nations, as indeed happened a thousand years ago. Okay. That is not a very good thing. Okay. And I hope it won't go much further. But the involvement of the Russians and the strong endorsement of Putin by the Russian church is another element in this. Okay. The Russian church is very close to Putin. Okay. Uh, so... Naturally, I mean, the Russian church would not have made that statement without Putin's approval or endorsement. Okay? So, uh, so that is another thing to watch, because we don't want this to be a, another crusade uh, type activity. Okay? Yes, yes. Uh, let me go back there. Yes. What is alluring the younger people today to these various kind of these, these groupings? Extraordinarily important question. Extraordinarily important question to which there is no answer which is this, what is it that brings young people 
to this. I have studied this for months. I have discussed with psychologists who study this. It is almost impossible for people like you and I to understand the mentality of people like this. What is it that suddenly takes? You can be a perfectly law-abiding person tonight and tomorrow you become a terrorist, okay? From a perfectly good home, okay? Uh, is it something in our society, in Western society? Is it that they are drawn to this out of some feeling of uh, guilt or... Uh, you can't really answer that question. It is a very important question. If you, if you could pinpoint one cause, say, they're all unemployed. That's not true. They're not, as many are employed. They're all poor. No, that's not true either. Okay. They're all dumb. That's not true either. Okay. Uh, they all come from broken homes. That's not true either. Okay. It's a very inexplicable thing how many people from stable backgrounds will be attracted to a philosophy that they know and welcome is killing. Okay. And, I mean, there are teams of psychologists and all that studying this. It's very difficult to answer this. If it comes only from the Middle East, you can say, okay, there's a lot of unemployment, you are young people, they are in difficulty. That you can explain in some way. But why Western society? Maybe you can even explain the Russian situation, that there are a lot of Islamic young people in southern Russia who are uh, angry at uh, Russian society and feel that they have no place there and Chechen war and that. But from Western Europe, from the United States, that is the big question. And I can't give you an answer, but I can bet that nobody else can give you a, a reasonable answer to this. Okay? Does it tell us something about our own society? I'm not sure that it does, okay? Uh, yes? What happens when ISIS gets a hold of weapons of mass destruction? Yeah. What, what's gonna happen in terms of, you, you know, we talk about this, you know, all the things that are gonna happen with these small entities, but what's gonna happen when they have a weapon of mass destruction? Question. Will ISIS get weapons of mass destruction and what happens when they get it? What happens when they get it, we know. You don't have to ask. You won't be here to ask. Okay. What, uh, will they get it is the real question, right? Okay. No, don't be so sure. Uh, it's very difficult for them to get it for this reason. To get nuclear weapons, you have to have access to a laboratory. You have to have a stable society. You have to have scientists working. It takes a long time to prepare this. It has to be coded also. It's not easy for a terrorist to get their hands on this, okay? That's one thing. So will some government give it to them? That's also very difficult because it can be traced to any government that gives it, okay? So that. Then can they get hold of radioactive materials, which not a bomb, but radioactive material? That is a possibility, unguarded material. So far, they haven't done that. To get a bomb is a very difficult thing. Uh, to get some radioactive materials is possible, but that won't be a very big thing. It'll be in a certain area, okay? Uh, easy, easy. Uh, your imagination is ahead of me, okay? Uh, so, then chemical weapons, okay? Uh, it's possible. If Assad can have chemical weapons, if we can have chemical weapons, if Saddam Hussein had chemical weapons, it's quite possible that they can get some chemical weapons. It's not the same as large, something like a nuclear weapon. It will be some, in some regions. Already chemical weapons have been used by terrorists. Remember the Japanese uh, 1995 Aum Shimrikyo Rikyo in the uh, subways. So that's a possibility. But you must remember this, that you can be very sure they don't have it. If they do, we'd have heard about it. Okay, they will not keep it in secret. Okay, so yes, that is. But the large-scale nuclear weapon is very difficult. Okay. Yes. yes. Why can't Syria uh, be considered? Let's say you were on the committee to redesign Syria, all right? And you could work with the Russians, and you could work with Assad, whoever you want to. But why couldn't Syria become? Syrian homeland again. If the rebels can be cleaned up, 
The Saudis can help pay for that. However, they pay for it. Why can't the U.S., why can't several military immigrants or two, three, four, however mm. many are coming out, why can't it be rerouted with a Marshall Plan to Syria? They came from Syria. They okay. The culture's there. Question is, there are so many millions now living in Syria. Can't they be rerouted and resettled in Syria? Not till the Syrian situation is as it'll take a long time. I think that eventually Syria will break into about three or four parts. Okay. Assad's part, okay. uh, probably a Kurdish part, okay. some other part run by some of Assad's opponents. Okay. Then we'll have to see if they want to go back or not. Okay. At the moment, they'll do anything to get out of Syria. Okay. And who will pay for it and so on. Um, if Assad survives this, you see, the basic thing that we are dealing with here is this. A hundred years ago, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. All the boundaries of the Middle East were redrawn. This is countries of the Middle East today. Okay. Lebanon, Iraq, uh, all that. They have lasted for about a hundred years. They are in the process of being redrawn again. In 10 years, you'll have to buy a new map of the Middle East. Okay? Countries are breaking apart. Lebanon is breaking apart. Iraq is breaking apart. Syria is breaking apart. Libya is breaking apart, and so on. Okay? The breaking up of boundaries always is accompanied by a lot of violence. Look at the breaking up of Yugoslavia. Okay? Serbs, Croatians, all that. Okay? Very rarely does breaking up take place smoothly. It happened. The Czech, Czechoslovakia blocked in the Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, peacefully. East and West Germany joined together peacefully, but that was one nation. But India and Pakistan. So breaking is in the process of breaking. This is one of the uh, things that come. Now, will those people go back? Who knows? Uh, first. Second, what sort of conditions in their homeland will induce them to go back? Not in the foreseeable future. Okay. When you have a country where there are 60% of the population is displaced, it is like saying 170 million Americans are displaced. Okay. And uh, a good part of them want to go somewhere else. So at the moment, this is, the, uh, this is happening, as I said earlier, the unstable part of the world is pouring a cascade of people into the stable part of the world. Okay. Will they go back? I don't know. Take Germany, good example. After the Second World War, Germany was short of people. They were recruiting people. They paid people to come from Turkey to Germany and so on, okay? They stayed there and they participated in society. Their children, grandchildren, brown, they don't, they speak German, they're Germans, okay? Well, more recently, they wanted to send some of these people back because their conditions were there. Uh, and they offered them money, they wouldn't go, okay? Some took the money, went and came back, sneaked in back again, okay? <laughs> on the assumption that it is better to be unemployed in Germany than to be employed in Turkey. So it's a very difficult thing. If, if everything is equal, things settle down, well, maybe there's a chance. But you know, how many refugees in the end go back? Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see, somebody back there. Uh, I can't see. Uh, yes? Is Israel taking refugees, and um, what do you think about it? Is Israel taking refugees? It's a big debate in Israel. Almost anything is a debate in Israel, but this is a, this is a big debate. Uh, the center right says no. Okay. The center left says we must take some refugees. It is, after all, the history of the Jews who have been refugees for so many centuries to take some people from neighboring. That is yet unresolved. Okay. Uh, it is going up and down, various political uh, debates are taking about this and so on. Uh, and that is where it stands now. Um, so far, not hardly anything. Israel does do something, which is, it helps some of those who are injured on the Syrian border. Golan Heights, okay? Medical assistance and so on. But absorbing them, no, okay? Not yet. That is a huge debate in Israel. Does the history of the Jewish people suggest that you must accommodate some refugees, whoever they are? Or should you preserve 
the structure of Israel as it is without adding to uh, different groups in Israel. It's, it's now a big debate. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Don't Europeans act a little bit more welcoming to Syrian refugees, given that their populations are getting old and their demographic growth is negative? Why don't Europeans act more generous to Syrian refugees, given that European populations are getting old and they need people? <laughs> Europeans need people, but they want people who look like themselves. Uh, they don't, want, don't seem to want people who are different from this. Where they're going to get other Europeans to come to Europe, I don't know. Uh, so then what you are saying in shorthand is this. Is Europe prepared to die and not to go, or to save itself by getting refugees of a different orientation? Well, the answer is very clear already. What did they do about Turkey? They could have taken Turkey in. They didn't. Okay. Europe is full of empty cradles. There is not a single country in Europe which has a growth population, all zero population growth or declining populations. Okay. Uh, there are three parts of the world that have this problem. Europe, Russia, and Japan. Okay. Uh, Europe, people will go to Europe. Not many will want to go to Russia. Okay. Japan is a more exclusive society, so they can get the people, but they don't want the people they can get. So then is it a choice of slowly aging away or uh, getting a different type of people to refresh themselves? They seem to have chosen the first path. They, otherwise, they would have let in Turkey long ago. In our case, we always chose the second path, get in people from other parts of the world. Now, that is what I'm worried about, okay? Because if we close ourselves in the name of security, and there are security risks, okay? Uh, are we cutting ourselves off from some of the best and brightest who will refresh America at a time when America is in need of so much competitive activity. We need people, uh, okay? Look at the huge contributions made in Silicon Valley, medical profession, scientific profession, business professions, okay? So that is the situation. Uh, we are in some kind of big global demographic mix-up, okay? Uh, the Western nations are not reproducing. Some nations are overproducing, okay? And now there's a means of communication. Some nations will take them, Europe won't take them. Okay. So there's some big uh, kind of demographic uh, upheaval taking place that will take a long time to adjust. Okay. As long as it was refugees and people from your own kind, there wasn't a problem. Even that, there was problems. Remember how the Irish, the Jews were treated? Okay. But it's much, oh, no. Uh, but when you get people so different, then there are problems. Okay. And Europe is the best example of this. How you're going to run Europe 50 years from now if you don't have any refreshment of the population? It's a big question. Okay. Yes. Why, why, why is there not a refreshment of the population in Europe? Why is it that Europe is not reproducing? we we'll have to ask the Europeans that question. <laughs> Somehow, people in certain areas have lost their fertility. Europe has lost their fertility. White people in this country are losing their fertility. The Russians have lost their fertility. Okay. Uh, Japanese, same thing. Is it urbanization? Uh, industrialization? Okay. The moment people... The best contraceptive in the world is urbanization. When people move into cities, they have fewer children. Okay? That may be one reason. Uh, whether it has something to do with their libido, I don't know. Okay? Uh, but I'll give you one, one interesting example. Italians are Catholics, rather passionate people. Their growth rate is 1.2 children for a family, far below replacement levels. You would never imagine it in Italy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Yes. What is the future for TEN in terms of demographics, let's say, with more, more of Islam coming into Europe and its consequential political implications? <coughs> what is the political consequence of Islamization in Europe? Very little, because the population in Europe is 600 million. There are 30 million Islamic people today, okay? Uh, it's not going to have that much of an impact. The impact will be if they don't fit into society, if there are riots, if there are uh, social, in absolute numbers, not very much, okay? Uh, the danger is that there will be politicians who will make use of this, and the vast majority will become so hostile to the minority that they'll make it almost impossible for those people to live in that country, and right-wing forces will rise, okay? But in absolute numbers, it's a very small number, okay? However, remember, it doesn't take numbers to trigger off all sorts of prejudices. Okay, uh, last one. Me? Yes. There is a lot of stabbing going on in Israel now. There's a lot of what? A lot of stabbing, knife. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going on, and the whole world doesn't mention it so much at all. How I mentioned it three times this evening. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 No. Uh, the question is, there's this lone wolf uh, uh, terrorism in Israel, okay? Uh, and that is a great concern. It doesn't seem to have any great organization behind it. It's not a political party, it's not a group, it's individual things. And it's very difficult sometimes to tell the difference between Israel, Sabra, and a Palestinian, okay? Second, uh, it doesn't seem to be a huge mass movement, although this is the peculiar thing about it. It doesn't threaten the safety of the state, but it threatens the security of individuals. Okay? The state is not affected by this, but the individuals are scared. Okay? So uh, Israel is coping, will we'll cope with it eventually. It is, doesn't seem to be organized by some political movement. It's not another intifada the two intifadas of 87 and 2000, it's not something like that. It's some kind of individual, will it be resolved if you have a Palestinian state? I don't know. Is that rewarding violence or not? That's another question, okay. Uh, so, it is very scary for individuals, but not a danger to the state. That is the paradox of this situation, okay. Israel will cope with it. They have been puzzled by this for a long time, because whom do you, you can't, get an organization. You can't put an organization out of business, okay? Because of these are individual activities. That is the uh, problem. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me. <laughs> Happy holidays. See you next year. <laughs>